Well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Haitian American Museum of Chicago, or HAMOC's second installment of Dr. Cranston Knight's lecture series. Uh, my name is Carlos Bossard, and I am the executive director of the museum. It's really good to see you all. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, today, Dr. Knight will be speaking on the geopolitical implications of the Rwandan genocide, um, which is the perspective that often gets overlooked. This program is also part of the museum's Black History Month lecture series. So we're really excited that you all are here. Thank you for joining us again. Hammock's mission is to promote Haitian art, culture, and history in metropolitan Chicago and surrounding communities nationally and internationally through advocacy, education, and supportive services. Education is at the core of our mission, and we are glad to continue bringing insightful, meaningful, and impactful lectures and programs to the community. Before we begin, I would like to do a little bit of housekeeping and let you kind of know the format of today's event. All of you were automatically put on mute as you entered the room. Please remain on mute throughout the program just so we can um, tone down any background noises. After the presentation, there will be a Q&A session with Dr. Knight moderated by Hammock's educator and grant writer, Ben Henderson. Ben has been with the museum for about over two years now and continues to be a huge asset, supporter, and friend of the museum. Um, hello everyone, my name is Ben Henderson and I'm the educator and grant writer at the Haitian American Museum Chicago. As Carl states, the Q&A will take place after the presentation. However, feel free to put questions in the chat during the presentation for Dr. Knight. During the Q&A session, all questions must be made through the chat. I will be monitoring questions throughout the, the program and relaying them to Dr. Knight. For those who haven't been to our previous two programs, Dr. Knight is a professor of history who teaches at the City of Chicago Colleges of Chicago. Dr. Knight got his PhD in history at Loyola University. Um, his work primarily focuses on international relations and foreign policy with an emphasis on its effects on smaller states like Haiti and Rwanda. On the side, Dr. Knight is a photographer, a poet, and an artist who works with the Haitian American Museum as a historian and a consultant. For today's program, he will discuss the geopolitical implications of the Rwanda genocide in order to explain why it happened and how great power, power rivalries made it worse. This is the third in a series that explores global affairs, history, and culture from African and African diasporic perspectives. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Knight. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Uh, so today we're going to be looking at the changes which took place in Rwanda and um, how great powers exasperated the situation, particularly the Belgians, in terms of uh, wanting to stay within its uh, francophone or French-speaking orbit, and the Anglophile um, countries which were impinging on uh, what, what the French considered to be their territory, meaning the countries of Uganda, uh, Tanzania, and Congo and how that eventually led to the exasperation and uh, infighting between Hutu and Tutsis and would lead to a genocide. Uh, I think the first thing that would be good as, let me, so I can get this up. Can you see this? Is this shared screen now? So if you would start, uh, the film. I think the film gives you some of overview of the, the things that I'm going to speak to you about, but also gives you kind of continuity in terms of changes in the geopolitical uh, um, francophone world. That's good.
Uh, Charles, they can't hear it. Can't hear it? No, unfortunately not. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. So what you're looking at is Kigali, and what you're watching is the, um, the airport. The French decided um, as the fighting between the Hutu and Tutsis increased, they decided unilaterally to begin to send in French soldiers. No one within the international community knew that they were coming. They simply showed up with about 3,500 troops. And um, their job was to bring out of Rwanda all French civilians. I think you can hear it now a little bit. Can you hear it? On the way in, they drove past the entire humway, waiting outside. Tutsis emerged from the hospital building where they'd been hiding for three days. They said they were surrounded by the militias, that some of them had already been killed. When it was clear the soldiers weren't going to help, the refugees appealed to the journalists. was a whole group of people, but in the whole group, one woman started to speak and started to explain why they were afraid and what was happening to them. And she started begging us to take her and the others with us. She was speaking to me, a woman to a woman, saying, I'm afraid, please help me. Yeah, we were just listening to her and then we couldn't do anything at that moment. We thought we couldn't do anything, just listen and say yes. So we left for the white people. It's over. But we knew the hundreds that stayed. And we heard the shooting the moment we left. So it was clear for me that hell starts for them. Hmm? All Western troops and UN peacekeepers were under orders not to evacuate ordinary Rwandans. What that meant was anybody that was white-skinned got to get on an airplane and fly to safety, and anybody that was black-skinned got to stay in Rwanda and get killed. And that's as simple as it came down to. It, it, it still to this day leaves a very, very bad taste in my mouth that the United States of America could have 350 Marines sitting at Bujumbura Airport that the French were able to get in 500 or so uh, paratroopers, that the Belgians had over 1,000 paratroopers. Um, you know, we basically had our intervention force already on the ground. You know, what they later told us, it was impossible to get on the ground. We had it on the ground on the 10th of April, within three days of this thing starting. And, um, but it wasn't there to intervene. It wasn't there to save Rwandans. It was there to save white people. And that, that's what it came down to. With the airport taking fire, the American embassy decided to evacuate its staff and expatriates overland in convoys south to Burundi, where U.S. Marines were waiting. And there were people standing on either sides of the uh, road. And uh, it's my recollection that I saw some instruments like machetes in their hands. Um, and I remember thinking, well, they're just waiting for us to get out of here before they go on about their gruesome business. I was working for the, the American embassy, basically. Uh, I saw them leaving. Uh, I saw the flags and the vehicles. I know all the vehicles, I know all the peoples they belong to, and so on. So I said, OK. Um, I think it was sad, surprising to see that uh, by the end of the day, you are a person who, have, who has to die when other people are allowed to be alive. This is a strange feeling. 
Americans were allowed to to be alive. My neighbors were allowed to be alive. They were walking on the street. They were going to the market, and uh, we're here, uh, feeling that we have to die. As she organized the last American convoy, Laura Lane made a final attempt to do what she thought was right. We had, we had a convoy of over 100 vehicles with over 600 people, only nine Americans. Greg and I were the last two. The ambassador was at the front. And yes, there were, there were Rwandans in there. There were Tutsis in there, and in some cases, there were Hutus. And so if they made it to our checkpoints and we, you know, we could hide them, we did. Some of them were, you know, we dubbed them Americans for the day. You know what I mean? We made them honorary Americans so that they could be in the convoy. If people in Rwanda ever needed help, now was the time. And everybody's leaving. Carl Wilkins had put his family on an American convoy, but he decided to stay behind with Rwandan colleagues and workers who'd sought refuge in his home. That Tutsi young lady and that Tutsi young men were faces right there to me representing the country. And I felt if I left, they were going to be killed. And then, and then I recognized, you know, how is it? I've got, a, I've got this blue American passport. That means I can go. But all of these people don't have a passport. They can't go. And, and, and while all of those things played in, the bottom line is it just seemed the right thing to do. By the evening of April 10th, Carl Wilkins was the only American left in Rwanda. Okay, I uh, hope you found the film interesting. Um, let me share this. I need to share this. I can't find my... I apologize, I'm just having a little trouble finding my... The rest of my... The film is important because it gives you a very clear indication of what was taking place in Rwanda. <clears throat> if we look at the Rwandan history, the history of Rwanda is that in the very early years of its creation, and it was created by the Belgians. First, the Germans came in and, 19, and held it into 1918, and after 19, uh, 1920, it was then transferred to the Belgians. The Belgians 
when they arrived using pseudoscience, looked at two groups of people who were there. One were the Hutu, the other were the Tutsis. One group um, were herders and the other group were pastoral. Because it was during a time of, of, of scientific understanding or attempting by Europeans to understand what it meant to be human, but more importantly, what it meant in terms of why is it that the certain people who are superior and other people are not, this became extremely important. And so what they basically did was using a science called craniology, a craniology, they would use instruments to measure the head and the nose. And what they decided was that the Tutsis were superior and more European-like, and the Hutu were a inferior group of people who came from perhaps Ethiopia and were therefore were inferior. Because they were a military power, the Belgians allowed the Hutu down to run the government, to go to schools, but to take all reins of power and the Hutus themselves were put out of um, basically disenfranchised from doing anything within the society. In fact, they were marginalized. The Belgians came back and said, there are actually two races of people here. In reality, you cannot tell a Hutu from a Tutsi. So our, the creation of race was artificial. But that artificiality, after a long period of time, had such a tremendous impact, it began not only to create ethnic tensions, but create racial tensions that would eventually lead to a series of riots in Rwandan history. What you see from this map is East Africa, you see Kenya up to the right, you see Tanzania, you see Uganda, you see Burundi and you see Rwanda. Both Rwanda and Burundi were created by the Belgians. They were actually one area. All of this, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, and Kenya were, it were either created by the British, which is Kenya and Tanzania, Uganda, uh, also uh, English, the other two, Belgium. These places were created and artificially uh, divided along uh, longitude and latitude by the colonial power, which was Belgium. In essence, all of this is artificially created. The people who traveled from one place to another did not see differences in themselves. Yes, there were kingdoms, but they did not use the term race or ethnicity. That was a new term that was created by the colonial power, which came in, i.e. the Belgians. The French have always been particular about their language. Up until relatively recent, French was the language of all diplomats. French was the language which most people learned to speak if they were considered to be cultured. And France considered itself to be a great power. But after 1945, having left lost to the German military earlier, and then at the end of 45, when so much of France was destroyed, France had a clear issue with its own identity. Since it had colonized a large part of Africa starting in 1905, it maintained that all countries which spoke French belonged to its Francophone policy and would be given not only economic power, economics, uh, as well as military. Um, whenever they needed, if there was an insurrection, they would send in soldiers, they needed food, they would receive that. If they needed loans, they would do that. So it became known as the Francophone family. At one time, France had as many as 25 countries which spoke French, all beholding to France. France also had another identity issue when it came to its self-interest because it had lost two major conflicts. After the Cold War, it had fought in Vietnam, it fought an eight-year conflict there, they lost. They then fought in Algeria, which was another eight years of fighting, they lost. France was extremely insecure and any country which spoke French, France quickly began 
to maintain that they were a major power because of all the African nations and a few Asians which were beholding to them. They then fell under what was known as the Francophone family. Because if we're looking at Africa, the countries which surrounded spoke, to Eng spoke English, the French had a real, almost paranoid um, sense that they were surrounded by those individuals known as Anglo-Saxons. They had a constant fear that one day they would lose their place in world history. Not necessarily true, but they felt that. And so very early on, as the situation in Rwanda began to deteriorate, and there was a major uprising by the minority group, which actually was the majority, was the Hutu. There were far more Hutu than there were Tutsis. And they were displaced. The individual who came to power, <coughs> excuse me, Huvio Huvanamina, uh, spoke French and the, and signed a series of military security acts with the French and was bought into the Francophone family. There is also a UN involvement and that in UN, that the, and the, I'm sorry, United States involvement. <clears throat> The United States becomes very interested in Africa by 1960. So by 1960 in Cold War, the United States is on edge with a real fear that the Russians are going to maintain bases in Africa. They were also afraid that there were many Marxist movements and there were many Marxist movements. There were movements were de which dealt with the issue of decolonialization. So in Congo, for example, um, <clears throat> when the uh, individuals there were fighting against the Belgians and Congo was a Belgian colony. The Americans sent in a number of individuals who overthrew the legitimate power and bought, uh, bought to uh, fruition an individual um, into political power named Mobutu. Mobutu was a great um, president, not so much. Did he do a lot of uh, graft? Yes, he did. But he was beholden to the Americans and no longer holding to the Belgian, most certainly was not beholden to the French. The United States became that much more interested in the countries surrounding them in the Great Lakes area, the Great Lakes area being composed of both uh, Rwanda and Burundi. And the United States began to work with the French as that country was fighting against Idi Amin, who came to power uh, in Uganda. The Ugandan Patriotic Front began to enlist large number of Hutu, I'm sorry, of Tutsis who were escaping persecution by the new government which had come to power in Rwanda under the Hutu. As those individuals were transitioning as refugees into camps in Uganda, they joined the uh, Ugandan uh, guerrilla forces, received training by the Americans, received arms, um, intelligence, how to gather intelligence, and for all practical purposes, because they started to do cross-border raids from Uganda into Rwanda, it began to escalate the hostility between both Tutsis and Hutu. By 1990, the, the Rwandan Patriotic Front, which was in Uganda, had decided that they were going to raid their former country and that they were going to come back to power. The British were very involved in the area because Uganda had been a former colony. Not only had they trained a the uh, guerrilla forces there, but they also acted as their intelligence force. They kept intelligence individuals who were in intelligence agencies, both in Uganda, but also in Rwanda. So they knew almost everything which was happening in Rwanda in real time. And that information was sent back to the guerrilla forces, which were fighting in two places. They were fighting in Uganda and they were fighting in Rwanda. So they were given all of the necessary military aid which they needed, but they also were, were allowed to closely monitor the government which was in power. They knew exactly where to attack because the intelligence allowed them to know where certain military groups were going to be. 
that made a huge impact in terms of how the war was beginning to turn in the favor of the Rwandan Patriotic Front. The, the U.S. also transported a number of Rwandans to the United States. They went to Fort Bragg. Uh, they learned not only intelligence, they learned uh, many of the skills that American Special Forces now use whenever they're fighting in wars abroad. <clears throat> I spoke earlier about the whole issue of, of uh, racism. How does one know the difference between a Hutu and a Tutsi? The bottom line is you do not. Early on, by 1933, Belgium passed a, a law which said that you must be classified as Hutu, Tutsi, or Twa. Those are three major groups that exist in Rwanda. And if you were caught without the passbook, not only could you be jailed, but uh, stripped of uh, being able to um, hold any jobs. So everyone had to carry a passbook. It was one of the most hated issues and heated issues between Rwanda, between in Rwanda, between Hutu and Tutsis. The passbook itself was mandatory. In many cases, it identified who you could marry, identified where you could travel in the country, it identified which jobs you could hold. When a genocide would take place, this passbook would become extremely important. As the genocide begins, people were asked to take out their passbooks. If they were traveling from one part of the country to the next, once the military in Rwanda came to power, and once they had decided that they were going to kill the Tutsi minority, if you entered into one of the checkpoints and you took out your passbook and it showed that you were Tutsi, you were immediately killed. If we talk about the changes which were taking place in Rwanda, it's 1959. And that 1959 is a huge Hutu rebellion. As I stated formally, the Tutsis have been chosen by the Belgians, ran the entire country. The majority of people in the country were Hutu. The minority was Tutsi. The Hutu at some point simply became tired of being relegated to a position whereby they had no power. And so you get an uprising. That uprising brings to power a Hutu government it also kills large number of Tutsis and many of them escape into Uganda and also into Congo, as well as other areas within the Great Lakes region. 62, under uh, UN auspices, Belgium allowed Rwanda to become an independent nation. However, um, violence continued in 1973, there was a major coup, and General um, Juvenal Haminawana became the de facto power, and eventually it, he would become the president. He immediately signs an agreement with the Belgians, and again with the French, such that there would be military cooperation as well as economic cooperation. <clears throat> as the Hutu came to power, the generation, literally, of Rwandans who were in the fields decided that they wanted to come back to their country. They realized very early the only way they were going to come back to their country was going to be through guerrilla warfare. It was not going to be through peaceful means. Many of the leaders had read the books of Franz Fanon, who wrote Wretched of the Earth. They were reading the handbooks by Mao Zedong, who was um, one of the major guerrilla fighters who came to power in China. They were reading the works of Nguyen Gap 
who had uh, become the major general uh, who was Vietnamese, had fought against the French and eventually again against the Americans. And his book and, and all the works which I've just cited, they talk about how to destroy a military. So those works were extremely important. In the early years, most of them were Marxist with some nationalist overtones. Eventually, they moved from a Marxist position to that of nationalists and to the position of wanting to go back into their own country. Because there was tremendous fighting in Uganda, as the Rwandans were coming into the country, many of them were bought into the Ugandan government. What they needed more than anything else was training. You can read all the books that you want, but unless you have the training, it does not allow you to be in a position whereby you can fight against an armed forces. The Hutu military was set along the guidelines of a traditional military. The Patriotic Front was a guerrilla force, which means you hit and run. You find the weakest point in the individuals that you're fighting against in that military, you attack them, you annihilate them. So when the Rwandan and the Uganda, sorry, when the Rwandans fought against each other, the Tutsis would find a weak spot in the Ugandan military. Um, I'm sorry, would find that weak spot within the Hutu military. Not only did you fight against them, not only did you kill, but you didn't take prisoners. You annihilated them. And this was straight from the playbook of the individuals whom they had read. <clears throat> Their major goal was not only to come back to Rwanda, it was to overthrow the Haramina government and to take over Rwanda by force. So it was very well known what their end point was. Their end point was to replace the government which was in power. As the fighting continued, starting in 1990, it went on into 1992, the United States United Nations became very involved. And this became extremely important because for a long time, Rwanda was not in the news at all. The French elevated Rwanda to a position that it ordinarily would not have had. There was only so much military and economic help that the government was able to give to the Rwandans. They needed an end to the war. And the French understood that the only way that they could do that once the Patriotic Front had moved 37 miles into the country was to bring it before the National Security Council. And for the first time for many people, they realized that they were fighting in this particular area. Militaries knew that there were. Some UN agencies knew that there were, but by and large, the Security Council did not know. So they, for the first time, now you get this elevation of this particular country in a status that heretofore had not had. They decided to have what was going to be known as the Russia Accord. And the Russia Accord, which was done in Trans uh, Tanzania, they stated that there was to be a demobilization of both the Hutu and Tutsi military. There was to be a reintegration of troops, that those troops that would leave power would be compensated in terms of um, money for the rest of their life, immediately ran into problems. One, the two groups hated each other. Second, who was going to uh, give the money? The United States said, it's not going to do it. The Belgians said, they were not going to do it. The French said, we're not going to do it. And that's that there was no one that was going to, that wanted to place itself in a position to provide a tremendous amount of money that would have de-escalated the situation. Quickly, the entire process faltered, failed, and they resumed fighting. The Russia Accords were finally signed in 1993, but everyone knew the moment it was signed, it was a failed document. Because the president of Rwanda has signed the Arusha Accords in Tanzania, that was seen by many within his government 
as treacherous as as him having sold the country out. Neither side liked the fact that that particular document had been signed. On his way back from Tanzania, his aircraft was shot down. And that aircraft contained not only the, the president of Rwanda, the president of, of Burundi, <clears throat> but many high um, military experts from both countries. Upon the crashing of that aircraft, the genocide starts. As we saw in the film, the French immediately sent troops in to evacuate its nationals. The Americans eventually came in, the other countries eventually came in, and at one point you had as many as uh, 4,100 troops on the ground. The question has always been brought up by General Romo Dallaire, who was head of the United Nations. Um, it is the United Nations mission to Rwanda that officiated the Arusha Accord. General Dallaire was over UN military. He's always stated if those 4,100 troops, which were used to evacuate those individuals from their embassy, there would have never been a genocide. Because people have always asked, where were the soldiers? And Dallaire's always said, we had them, they were here, but they had other things that their government told them they should and should not do. He always stated in his book, Shake Hands with the Devil, we needed those troops here now under UN control so that we could stop the genocide. But that was not forthcoming. <clears throat> this is simply showing that the two individuals who aboard the aircraft. This particular aircraft was given to um, the president of Rwanda by French Mitterrand, who was, uh, of course, the president of France. And it showed the aircraft before it was shot down. Once again, upon his assassination, the genocide is goes into full effect. We go back a few years. Um, by 92, many within the um, Hutu government had already planned for a genocide. They had already decided that they were going to kill off the Tutsi population. This was not known throughout all of um, the Hutu government, but it was known by those individuals who wanted to commit the genocide. The question has always been, what was French implications? New documents show that these individuals in cohort with the highest officials in the French government decided who would live and who would die within the Tutsi society. And those individuals who they felt would be the enemy of the state or could cause more military action or bring into the fighting European government. So they were targeted at least a year to a year and a half before the genocide actually takes place. The catalyst which starts it, of course, is the airplane crashing. And from that point on, the genocide starts. <clears throat> As the fighting took place, the, because the um, Hutus who were in power needed arms, the French sent in tremendous amounts of arms. And they also sent in troops to be with that particular government. The Belgians were not under their own laws allowed to give that particular government guns, but they did, did give them other things like armored vehicles. They gave them small aircraft, they gave them training, they gave them boots, they gave them uniforms. So it is not simply a genocide in which there aren't other countries involved. There are other countries involved. And these countries are fighting over whether it be Anglophile or whether or not that country is gonna be Francophone. 
for them, it is not so much the people who are being killed. It is who is going to run the country. Is it going to be those who speak French or is it going to be those who speak English? For the Americans, it's going to be those who speak English. It's going to be the American center. For the French, it's a French center. Were the people important? Sure they were. But what's more important are the goals. Who will hold power and who will not? <clears throat> the UN, is, it's, I mentioned before, um, um, sent in the United Nations mission for Rwanda. And that mission was as much as possible to, to carry out the Arusha Accords, which would um, have demobilization of both militaries, both Hutu and Tutsis, the RPF, as well as the Rwandan uh, government troops. And as I said, that did not work very long. Um, to derail the Arusha Accords, you had close to five thousand troops uh, in Rwanda early on because the genocidal group in the Hutu government which wanted to kill Tutsis they realized that if they could kill as many Europeans as possible there was a good possibility that the UN would withdraw its forces. If it would withdraw its forces not only would there would not be intelligence on the ground in terms of what was taking place, but they could proceed without any eyes watching, documenting, and giving information back to the United Nations in terms of what was taking place against the individuals who had, they had decided to kill. After 10 Belgian soldiers were killed, there was a call in the United Nations to dismantle the entire UN mission. The only country which held out was New Zealand. New Zealand said no. And that's because at the time there was a rotating presidency within the United Nations. It is their sole vote which kept UN troops in Rwanda, but the large number of UN troops that had been deployed before left. In essence, at the end, there were only 250 UN soldiers. Basically, none. They, they only could do, they could effectively do nothing. There was another group which was made up of Nigerians who came later, of which there were 350, and they decided that they would stay also. Delair, who was over the UN forces, stated very clearly there had been a genocide. Um, there had been a Holocaust in Germany. And this genocide, people could never say that there had not been large number of people of killing because they now would bear witness to the killing which had taken place. I also saw um, here I have the second um, UN deployment, another 5,000 troops are sent. They arrived between June and July. The genocide had ended by 1994. For all practical purposes, it, they, it was useless. The United States fought hand and foot to stop sending any supplies to these individuals, that is this new group of UN troops. They needed aircraft, they needed arms, they needed armored personnel carriers. The United States would not give them armored personnel, give the UN armored personnel carriers unless they bought it. The UN had no money. Who was going to pay for the gas? And that's what they hamstrung them on every single issue at the directive of President Clinton. Clinton did not want to become involved. He did not want Americans' hands in, in, in the era. He did not want to give the United Nations any military aid whatsoever. What's the issue? The United States had, had just only a few months uh, before that had had troops in Somalia. That entire situation had ended extremely bad. The Americans had not only lost prestige, but had to move out of Rwanda, I'm sorry, out of Somalia, and literally had no teeth for wanting to go back into Africa. Nobody wanted to go back into Africa. 
he told his staff very clearly, no one will use the term genocide on my watch. Using the term genocide under the 1948 uh, Act in the United Nations meant that all soldiers from countries around the world who were signature to the 1948 um, Accords to end the Holocaust or new genocides would have to act, meaning they would have to send troops into the area. Clinton did not want to send Americans. He forbid the word to be used. As the fighting continued, <clears throat> and he had a large number of uh, Tutsis being killed, um, towards the end, the um, RPF was winning the conflict, not only because of their superior ability to maneuver around large number of Hutu uh, militaries, but also because so much of the Hutu military was involved in the genocide that they spread the forces thin. To save the government, the French unilaterally sent in a large number of French troops and they set up a safety zone near Goma, which is right, in south, south, right inside the, the Congo. And many of the individuals who were participants in the Rwandan genocide were able to be saved by the French forces. And that's what the French forces did not want that government to, to ever be held accountable for its acts of killing. Okay. Many people have often said that, um, you know, um, there's, there, was no, 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 there was no factual evidence. This is a satellite, which is not spelled by a photo of genocide. Uh, this is American um, satellites. The Americans kept satellites over Rwanda for the three months from the time that it starts in June, I'm sorry, in April to the time that it ends in June. And those satellites were there 24 hours a day. The information was then debriefed, the images enhanced, that was taken to U.S. military, and then it was taken to the and uh, in terms of brief to President Clinton. Clinton saw these same photo, this particular photo, but there were others. He saw those every day at every single briefing. Very aware of the fact that large number of people were being killed. So when it, when he was asked, "Well, why didn't you become involved earlier?" His response was, "I didn't think it was that bad." Reality, he really knew how bad it was because he got daily briefings by the Central Intelligence Agency. <clears throat> Everybody knew every single day what was happening in this country. And it's by Phil Giard. He was the head of the Red Cross, an amazing individual. He wrote a, an amazing book. He stayed through the entire genocide. He suffered from post-traumatic stress syndrome, um, had a very difficult time, just recently died. There were reports from Washington, Brussels, the Vatican, London newspaper. There were reporters all across the world that were there in Rwanda that was not only taking photos, uh, writing. There were writing news, made all the major publications. Whenever someone said the genocide didn't exist, did not take place, and many people for a long period of time said it wasn't that many people that could have been killed in that short a period of time. In essence, from the time that it starts in April to the time that it ends in June, we have something like 1.1 million people killed. Um, I thought what was placed here by this young man, don't tell me, uh, sorry that you didn't know, everybody knew. If we talk about the death toll, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the genocide uh, starts in April and ends in June 1994. In 100 days, 1 million people were slaughtered, which meant there were 10,000 were murdered per day. That meant 400 per hour, six per minute. Uh, just some key terms. This is the last slide. Just some key terms. Uh, the Rwandan uh, government <clears throat> under Hutus. I uh, had three groups which were, I'm sorry, two groups which aided in the killing. One was the Intahumwe, or its youth wing. 
and they committed the largest number of killings. The others were called the general societies, and these were individuals who killed their neighbors. So Hutu and Tutsi have lived side by side for centuries. And one day I tell you, that person's your enemy. That person is why all of the harshness are taking place in the country. And if we kill those individuals, everything is going to be just fine. And so large number of neighbors killed each other. So you've got your friend next door and people would, you would go next door and it would kill your neighbor. And that took place throughout Rwanda. So you had these two groups, you had the army, you had the Intahumwe, which was the youth group, and you had the genocides, which was just your average person on the street that decided to pick up uh, a weapon and kill their neighbor. Uh, with the ending of this, uh, if there's any questions, I think we've got maybe five or six minutes, but if there's any questions, would you take it? Uh, Hello? Yeah. 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 Okay. So we don't we don't have any questions in the chat so okay. far on our stuff. Let's apologize. Uh, I apologize for uh, this program being a little late. So um, we're gonna try to keep this go, go over a little limit over maybe like for five minutes and all that stuff yeah. in order to make sure we get some questions and um, properly assessed and answered. Okay. So I guess I'll get started first. Um, so. Um, so one of the big things about the Rwandan genocide was the role of uh, conspiracy theories and sort of fake news, most notably through the radio. Um, in what way did uh, the great powers sort of interact with that and knew um, how that was contributing to conditions on the ground? Uh, they absolutely knew. <clears throat> the question was always why at least for an, an, an American uh, part, because Americans actually had observation planes, which was flying over Rwanda, and they also had aircraft, which were uh, could have jammed um, the Hutu uh, hate radio. They decided not to. Could they have done so? Yes, but they decided they were not going to get involved. Uh, that was also true of other major powers. So these powers have aircraft and satellites, which could have jammed the uh, hate radio they decided that they wouldn't. And for no other reason than they decided that, that they wouldn't. There was no clear reason given ever why they did not jam it. Clinton says, well, in hindsight, we should have, we could have. The reality was he didn't want to. Okay. Okay, um, sorry. Um, so we got a question from uh, one of our participants. Um, how did the genocide officially end and what were the repercussions um, in the Great Lakes region? Um, the genocide basically ended when, the, one, there was almost no Hutus left to kill, and two, when the French entered and created a safe way for the former Hutu government to escape into the Congo. What were the repercussions? Um, a year and a half after the Tutsis came to power under um, Kagame, they attacked the refugee camp, killed close to a million people, and that will launch the first Congolese war. Then it will launch the second Congolese war uh, in which um, 12 nations fought. In fact, it would become the second largest war since the second world war, war conflict. Um, they think anywhere between five and eight million people are gonna be killed in the first and second Congolese war. Not counting the million refugees killed by the um, Kagame regime. Yeah, it's uh, really bad. I mean, all right, um, do we have any more questions? Um, we got uh, maybe uh, about a few more minutes left of this program. I think if I can say, I'll just add, uh, what's important is that <clears throat> the question has always been, uh, has, uh, has, has been brought up uh, a number of times, and it is, can genocides take place again? And the answer is yes. And we've seen them. Darfur, um, the situation which is now taking place in, in the southern part of Sudan, and um, 
uh, through other countries. Um, genocide. It, I, I saw a very good uh, documentary uh, called Night and Fog about uh, um, Dachau and Auschwitz. And it always says, genocide sleeps with one eye open. As long as we can marginalize people, as long as we can dehumanize them, genocide is always there. Whether or not people have the will to stop it is something completely different. Whether or not governments will want to become involved to stop it, that's another question. And from what we've seen since the Rwandan genocide, they don't have the teeth, nor the backbone, nor the skills in which to stop these situations before they start, because they don't just show up. They take time and governments monitor each other. They know when things are starting to spin out of control. Yeah, um, that's certainly true. Um, we saw that with um, the, the Rohingya in 2016, 2017. Uh, we're currently seeing that and then um, uh, Xinjiang province and China and all that stuff. And well, of course, this opens all sorts of questions like how can you enforce something when one of the one of the great powers who are supposed to enforce the rules of the UN itself has a veto on pretty much anything regarding human rights and all this stuff. Uh, the same goes to, of course, towards the United States and France as well, because they were able to, you know, hide some of the stuff they did in Africa as well. Like uh, the British were, for example, they pretty much hid all their, um, well, th there was recently a book that came out on Operation Legacy and all that stuff that hid all the sort of war crimes that went down in Kenya during the colonial era and all that stuff. Yes. All right. Uh, I, I would say like that was uh, some really good questions too. And Dr. Knight, I'm really happy that you brought up that last question and if it can happen again. Um, you know, the geopolitical implications of the Rwandan genocide, like we said at the beginning, is something that is so kind of glossed over, you know, and kind of the responsibilities that um, all these different countries had um, and didn't kind of take up. It's, it's interesting and, and, you know, asking if, if it could have been prevented. And in, I think in many ways that it could. Um, but, you know, I do want to uh, just say thank you, everyone, for joining us today, um, this afternoon. I'm really happy that you're able to be here and be a part of the conversation. Dr. Knight, as always, thank you for sharing your research and your con contribution to the Haitian community and the Black diaspora. I think this is an extremely important topic, and I'm really happy that we're able to see kind of a different side of this and learn even more about this really horrific event, but very important kind of the history of the world. Um, and of course, thank you uh, to our museum educator and grant writer, Ben, um, a really good job with the Q&A session, um, really good questions in there. Before we go, I do just wanna make one quick announcement um, and it's gonna be for our last lecture in our Black History Month lecture series that's happening this Thursday, February 25th at 7 p.m. Uh, Hammock's president and founder, Ms. Elsie Hector Hernandez, is gonna be a part of a panel discussion and celebration of Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, um, who is the Haitian founder of Chicago. Um, it is being put on by Black Heroes Matter. It's a really great panel discussion and uh, we'll have some information out on that. Um, and hopefully you all can join us. It's gonna be, it's gonna be really good. Um, again, thank you all for being here. I'll, I'll send out a follow-up email with some additional information here shortly. Um, be safe, stay warm. It's supposed to snow here in Chicago again. So yes, we'll, uh, we'll see, we'll see about that. Um, and I do look forward to having you all in our programs in the future. Um, so thank you again and, and have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks so much. Thanks, Marilyn. All right, I'm going to stop this.